Hey everyone, thank you so much um, for joining uh, Kachi Kitchen today. I wanted to start uh, first by talking a bit about my project. Um, so as uh, I don't even know if some have mentioned this, but my project um, is looking at um, Ugandan Indian Ugandan refugees who came to South Carolina in 1972. Uh, so I'll step back a bit because that might have been a, a mouthful. But um, in the mid uh, to late 1800s, the you know the British. I mean, this is really a story of colonialism. It's a story of empire building. Um, so you know, of course, we know that in India and in East Africa, the British uh, had colonized um, and ruled over with you know a lot of pain and difficulty and theft and abuse. But um, part of uh, what they did was um, support an indentureship program. So uh, as many of you are probably well aware that uh, Indian indentured migrants went to the Caribbean, uh, to Fiji, to South Africa. There was a very, very small number, around eight, um, I guess 37,000, I think, uh, that uh, were sent to Uganda to build, uh, so Uganda is in East Africa, to build uh, a railway that took, um, that would steal resources from the Ugandan interior out to the coast um, in Kenya. So, um, and unlike other indentured labor projects, uh, three quarters of these Indians, uh, mostly from the Punjab region, went back to India, but there was a small um, minority that decided to stay uh, in Uganda and in Kenya and uh, start their lives there. And um, following that, you know, of course, part of the way the British ruled is that they really stratified um, commerce, they stratified the economy uh, along racial lines. So you had um, native black Africans who were working in mines, who were working as laborers and uh, the British really encouraged Indians to come and build uh, shops along these rail the railways that the indentured laborers built. And that's how a lot of um, Indians uh, came to East Africa. And that group were from the regions of Kutch and Katiawara. Um, uh, you know, a, a nice portion of them, pro um, you know, maybe about 40% uh, were from that region. And with them, they brought Kutchi, the language of Kutchi, and with them, they brought their traditions. Um, but of course, I, I do want to, to um, emphasize that this is not the first time these two regions had come into contact, but it was really uh, the first time that there was systemic settlement. Um, you know, of course, um, the western part of India and the eastern part of Africa share the Indian Ocean, right? So there was commerce uh, between the two regions for centuries. Um, of course, with uh, when the the Portuguese figured out how to uh, get around the Port of Good Hope, uh, you know that trade that was happening along the Indian Ocean lateral was um, just systematically eliminated. So, but we do have strong connections in the South Asian. Um, continent and East Africa. And that's my personal history, right? Um, I'm not from Uganda, I'm from Tanzania, I'm from Dar es Salaam, grew up in Toronto. And uh, now I live in South Carolina, <laughs> which is really exciting. Um, you know, life takes you to the South sometimes. So when I first arrived here in South Carolina, um, I, I went to the Jamaat Khana. So Jamaat Khana is the mosque, the masjid, uh, the house of prayer for Ismaili Muslims. And Ismailis are a, um, a sect of uh, Shia Islam. I went there and, you know, I was like just talking to people and there were so many Ugandans. I was really happy that there were East African Indians in the Kane. Um, you know, I come from a community of East African Indians, but there's not a lot here in the States. Um, and they had told me actually that um, the first Jamaat Kane in the United States was this Kane I went to, Spartanburg Kane, which is in the upstate of South Carolina. And that the reason that, uh, you know, that was the first Kane is because um, when Idi Amin, who was the dictator of Uganda, took power, uh, he, um, in 1972 declared as a nationalist project uh, that Asians or Indians that had settled since, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s in East Africa. And like some, you know, people were third or fourth generation Ugandan had to leave. So um, they were basically just kicked out of the, the country. And if you were a Ugandan citizen at that time, you became effectively stateless. Uh, so 
Uh, a lot, a majority went to the UK, a big, uh, those with U, uh, British uh, passports or British subjecthood, a large portion of the stateless um, refugees went to Canada, a very, and I cannot even emphasize how small it is, 1,500 out of the 80,000 that were kicked out of Uganda, uh, 1,500 landed in the U.S. through a parolee program, and 500 of them um, settled right here in South Carolina, to, to my surprise and pleasure when I moved here. So I thought it was important to tell that story. I, I told it as in a really long-winded way, but um, so while I was interviewing um, a lot of these um, Ugandan refugees, I mean, refugees from 1972, a lot of them have their green cards, you know, some of them have their citizenship. I mean, part of not being a refugee, but being paroled into the country was that your path to citizenship was a bit more difficult. And I could talk a bit about why there weren't refugees, but I'll move on. <laughs> but, um, you know, the way, and you, and if there's people out there that do collect oral histories, you know a way people tell stories through food. It's a really important way that people tell stories. And it's a joyful way. Like when you're talking about being kicked out of the only home you knew, settling in a new country. I mean, they all spoke English. There wasn't a language barrier, but there was definitely a cultural barrier. Food is comfortable. Food is inviting. And food tells the story of migration. So what I wanted to do today was bring together some dishes from East Africa with um, they're East African Indian dishes. So, you know, they're, it's foods that we've eaten for generations and that we've modified, you know, based on where we've lived, coming from the subcontinent to East Africa and now in the South. So we'll tell those stories through food. So um, I uh, will be making three dishes today. I'll be making choraja bhajia, which is, um, I don't know if you can see this, but black eyed peed, black eyed peas um, bhajia. Bhajia is like a a fried fritter. Uh, we'll be making mandazi, which is uh, an African donut. That's what my mother calls it, and she'll be making that for us. Um, and then Ashrafanti will be making mogo. And mogo in um, what you might know it here in, East, uh, in North America, especially if you live in the South, it's known as yuca. And in West Africa, it is cassava. It's not a plant that I, um, that and Ashrafanti will talk about that's that that you would have gotten in the subcontinent, but um, the way that Indians make it in East Africa has a bit of an Indian twist. All of these dishes do. Um, so we um, and and you know I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. If you've been keeping up with what's been happening in the past couple of days uh, in the Washington Post with Jean Wingarden, um, you know I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet anything, but I'm always reading and people were complaining like, what's the one ingredient? So I don't, this will make no sense to you if you haven't been following the story, but there's this food writer in the Washington Post who decided to chronicle all the foods that he didn't like for some reason. Um, and one of the foods that he didn't like, I kid you not, is Indian food. And he said, the reason he doesn't like it is that how can an entire country uh, build their cuisine on one spice? which makes absolutely no sense. Like, I don't know what that one spice is, like garam masala. I don't know anyone who actually uses garam masala. We use the individual spices, but you know, there's a diversity in Indian cooking, right? There's a diverse, and not to mention the diversity in the cooking from the subcontinent. And then you add the piece that I'm um, going to be doing today, which is the, the Indian diaspora, the, you know, the, the not, not the North American diaspora, but, you know, the diaspora in East Africa, we could, you know, there's, if you've been to the Caribbean or eat Indo-Caribbean Indo food, you, you know, that there's a lot of diversity there in terms of uh, the way foods have traveled and, and, and changed, um, uh, rotis or doubles, or there's, you know, lots of curries um, that ha have their kind of you know, have a piece of India uh, in this Caribbean and cooking. So um, just to say that that's an idiotic thing <laughs> to say that Indians cook with one spice. And, you know, today we'll show you that that's absolutely not the case. Not that I have any affinity to the Indian continent. I'm speaking Indian ethnicity. <laughs> um, but so we'll learn to cook and we're not using a lot of spices. So I think that's kind of a piece of um, East African Indian cooking is that we don't use garam masala so much, right? So like this, uh, you know, I, and I tell my partner all the time that um, like we don't, our cooking is very mild. It's Indian, Indian and whatever that means, right? Um, but we don't use kind of this heavy masala that I think this um, Jean Wingarden was, uh, you know, was alluding to. So anyways, 
I really did want to mention that. So we'll start, I'll start with um, bhajia. So this is the dish we're going to be making. Um, I have put the recipe um, that I put um, online is half a cup of black eyed peas, but of course you can make one cup, two cups. So what you want to do first is soak these black eyed peas overnight, your amount of black eyed peas you want to soak just in water. So I've actually, I actually put this to soak this morning, um, at, you know, whatever, eight o'clock. I, I don't ever wake up that early. Just today I had a meeting. So we'll drain the water out of there. These are really, the other thing I picked is really simple dishes. We're not making anything too complex and they're all fried. I realized, so sorry if you're if you don't like fried food or can't eat fried food, but I think it's also like they're all nasta food, right? Like I think in India, I, I'm not sure. I, I've heard that this is actually British that we, by hook or by crook, as we say, is you will have chai at five o'clock and you always need a nasta. So this, you know, bhajia, mangazi, and mogo all fall into that category of what you would eat at five o'clock, um, you know, after work. Um, you know, in Dar es Salaam or in Kampala or wherever. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to blend this. You're not, all you're doing is soaking it. So you, we have, we're not cooking it. You didn't boil it, nothing. It's basically raw that you will blend it um, in a food processor. A blender won't work. You'll want to use a food processor. Um, and then we have half um, an onion, um, right? So half a cup of black eyed peas, half an onion. I like a lot of onion. You can use more or less depending on your taste. Um, you can cut them up into big chunks because you're just throwing them into the food processor. So that is, uh, so again, soaked black eyed peas, raw onions, raw black eyed peas, and then you're going to blend it in the food processor. I'm not going to do that because it's going to be really loud. Um, so when we come back from watching uh, the video about Mandazi I already have blended it. So we're going to do the budgie on pieces and um, we're going to break up the budgie out with videos <laughs> with other food. So right now we'll start a video on how to make Mandazi. Mandazi is an African donut, as my mom calls it. And it's actually my mom that's going to be teaching us how to make Mandazi. It's one of our favorite foods. So here's a video on Mandazi. segment of Kachi Kitchen and I'm uh, very excited to introduce you all to my mom. It's my mommy, Yasmin Rahimtula. Mom, tell us a bit about yourself. So we're not Ugandan, um, but the food that Ugandan Asians make and the food that um, Tanzanian Asians make is pretty similar. So just tell me quickly um, about you and your family and uh, when, you know, when did your parents come from India and where were you born and raised? Okay, my name is Yasmin uh, Nadji. My married name is Yasmin Ramatula. My father and my mother immigrated from Gujarat, India in the 40s. And I was born there in Tanzania. And we have always been brought up with African, the Indian and African fusion of food. So today what I'm going to show you is mandazi, which is equivalent to donuts here. So in um, Tanzania, we never used to get donuts. Like there were hardly any bakeries or coffee shops that would sell donuts. So the local, locals came up with mandazi. And as I said, it's equivalent to donuts. And so today, a, a bit sorry. about mandazi. Um, it's a very coastal food, right? Like you find it in Zanzibar and a lot in the coast. And what do we eat mandazi with? Correct. So mandazi can be eaten just with coffee by itself. Or it also goes well with uh, barazi, which is uh, pigeon peas. So you cook the barazi in coconut milk. And then you can have that as a... It, it's a traditional breakfast in, in Tanzania with, with, and the, with the Indian people. African Indian people. So in the mornings, we usually have mandazi and barazi. Um, so I'll, I'll put it, uh, I'll put a link um, on the, uh, at the end here where you can find an, uh, a recipe for barazi because it's so yummy to 
dump the mandazi in the brazi and eat it for breakfast. And if you're like in Zanzibar and you walk into any, you know, shop or restaurant, that's what you'll have for breakfast. Yeah. And then when you fry the mandazis, they poof up. They really poof up. So it's in the middle, it's hollow. So what you can do is just make a little hole and pour in your <laughs> brazi in it. And then you can eat like a sandwich too. So good. Okay. So show us. Okay, so here I have one cup of flour, half a cup of sugar, a teaspoon or less than a teaspoon of elchi, which is cardamom. Now this one here is optional. The Africans don't usually put it, but as I said, this is a fusion between African and Indian cooking. So we use this for, um, um, for labor. For flavor, thank you. thank you for flavor, yeah. I have two tablespoons of cooking oil, any vegetable oil. And here I have my yeast that I have prepared in warm water. One tablespoon, one, that, one less than tablespoon of yeast in warm water with a pinch of salt, sugar, and flour. And it will rise like this. So this How long one you have to keep it for in that bowl? So uh, it would rise within five minutes. Okay. Okay. Again, this is half a cup of milk. The traditional Africans don't use milk. They only use water. I have started using water also because one of my friends, her daughter is lactose tolerant. So one day I tried to make the mandazi uh, with water only to knead the dough with water and it turned out just as well but the milk gives you a little bit of nutrition so i we always used to use milk so i will one cup of flour i'll mix my sugar in it my cardamom elchi mix it a little bit So that it's all mixed together. Then I'll put my cooking oil for shortening. Again, mix it. As you see. And now I will put in my yeast to knead the flour. So when I prepare my yeast in the water, that water won't be enough. So you will have to, as I said, I use water or milk. So now I'll put the milk in to knead the dough. I might not be able to use the whole thing because I think I had a bit uh, more water than I should have. Um, you need it by hand, right? I remember I told you my friend who's Somali, um, who also makes mandazi and chapati, or her mom does. Uh, she bought a um, a mixer. What's that really fancy brand? KitchenAid. KitchenAid. She said she bought a KitchenAid mixer for her mom, and it works really well. Have you ever tried it in a mixer? Well, when you buy me a KitchenAid mixer, I'll try it. Okay, I'll put it on my to-do list. Um, Mom, can you tell the story about, um, you know, as you're kneading, tell the story about how um, you made mandazi for like a multicultural fair at my school. Do you remember that? Right. So I did, oh, when Omi was in elementary school, they had this um, international day and everybody were making food from their own countries. And so... Omi's teacher had asked me to show them uh, something from Africa. So I had made mandazis. So I had gone to her school to demonstrate the way I'm demonstrating now. And we made mandazis. And all the kids were so excited. But the funny thing is, <laughs> when they picked up the mandazi, because as I said, when you fry them, they poof up. And then it's hollow inside. 
So they weren't expecting that. So, so when one of the kids started eating that, and it's still hollow, he goes to me and says, Miss, this is hollow inside. Why? So I had to explain to him. I said, you can use it as a sandwich, which I mentioned before, that you can put the baraz in, or you can put anything. I like even to put cream cheese in it, or I like to put jam in it, so it becomes a, a Danish, uh, some Danish, I guess, jam Danish or cheese Danish. So you can, it's very, very versatile. You can use it with anything. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting that you Danish, like, so you, you have the, it's an African dish. You've added the elchi to make it very Indian and a bit of milk. Um, and then also like cream cheese and jam. And those are things we get here, you know, in the North America. Yeah. So it's really become this fusion food. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, you know, like whatever your taste is, whatever you like. Like even the sugar, if you don't have too much sugar, you can reduce the quantity. Put less than half a cup of sugar in one cup of flour. And then if you like it, you can add more. If you like very sweet, if you have a sweet tooth like me, you can put more than half a cup of sugar. And if you want to make more mandazis, you can double the recipe also. Um, and then I just want to go quickly back to um, what you were saying about uh, when you came to my school. like. You know, the teachers, they didn't ask you to make an Indian dish. Is that because you made it very clear to them that you're from Africa or like, how did that come about? Like if someone were to ask you to make a food from your country, I think maybe they would expect you to make Indian food, right? Actually, I, I can't remember now because this no. is so long ago, but I'm assuming that somebody else was making food from India mm -hmm. or that's why maybe they want this or maybe there was nobody from Africa in, in, your, in your class. So that's why they asked me to, so sorry, here is the, sorry, my bowl was showing. Uh, so here, it's already needed. So the dough is almost done. I'll need a little bit more and then I'll start rolling it. So you, uh, you know, when the bowl was blocking, what you did is you put a bit of just regular flour on. Yeah, oh yeah, just, little, yeah, to, to, so that the dough doesn't stick to the um, cutting board. I'm using a cutting board, but back home we used to have a wooden um, round circular, we call it patlo. So it's more like a cutting board also, but we used to roll everything like the chapatis and whatever needs to be rolled, we use, we, we use that uh, round uh, cutting board. Mm -hmm. But here, this one here, I have a glass cutting board, which is good and it says, it says, uh, Recipe for an amazing woman. <laughs> oh, it's so cheesy. <laughs> so here it is. It's almost done. My rolling pin rolled away from me. I put this away. It's making a bit of noise here. All right. So now I'll roll it like a log. And I'll cut into portions. So I'll make... It depends how big your ancho mandaz is. You can make either four portions to make big mandazis. And if you want small mandazis, you can make um, six portions or five portions, depending on how you want your mandazis. Okay, so this is all done. And by the way, I always like to use um, pizza cutter to cut because uh, it cuts very nicely, smoothly, rather than a knife. Okay, so what I'm going to do is make half of this. And I guess I'll make maybe five. Yeah. Yeah, so I have made five portions now. So each portion will make about four mandazis. And I'll show you one how to roll. And oh, by the way, I after I finish rolling, I keep this mandazis for about a couple of hours. Till the till it rises. You keep after you cut it, then you keep it. Right? Yeah, some people like to keep the dough and then roll it. I like to roll it and then keep the rolled mandazis because when you keep the sorry, when you keep the dough, it stretches. And then when you're rolling it, it's a bit difficult to roll. Mm -hmm. So I like to do it this way. I like to roll and then leave the mandazis for it to rise. Right. 
Because you have to leave it for how long do you leave it? An hour? It depends on the temperature in your house, whether it's winter outside, summer outside, you know, it all depends. So I usually like to keep it for a couple of hours and then start frying and then you will see they, they poof up. Eyes up. Oopsie. Yeah, so these are what done. I will show you how I roll one and I keep it here. It's a rolling pin which rolled away. <laughs> Okay, so I will put some flour so that it rolls smoothly. So you would roll it like a chapati and then cut into four portions. It's interesting that you called it chapati because that's not what we call it. Sorry? That's not what we call it. What? Chapati. We don't say chapati. Rotli, but now because this is an African dish, I'm showing chapati. Rotli in, in, in Swahili is chapati. Or round, like a, a little smaller than a dinner plate, I, I would say, you know. There. And then I would cut into half. This and then, thing of the pizza cutter is very innovative. When did you start doing that? It was, uh, I started with the knife, but when I do it with the knife, you have to go again and again and again. With the pizza cutter, you just slide it. But where did you get the idea to use a pizza cutter? Because I was having a hard time with the knife. So I, you know, I tried the... I tried a couple of different kinds of knives first to see which one cuts better. Mm -hmm. And then I eventually I found this. If you want, I can show you how it happens with the knife. No, 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 that's fine. I just think it's it's brilliant to use the pizza cutter. Okay, okay. so this here, as you see now, um, I have laid them out. And now I'll let this sit for a couple of hours and then we'll see you again in a couple of hours when I'm trying them. Okay. Thank you. We'll see y'all okay. soon. Bye. So here we are again. Sorry, my video is not working, so I have to bend down a little bit. But you can see the frying pan. The oil is heated up. So I usually heat up the oil a notch below the high level. Okay. So my oil is all ready. And here I go, dropping the mandazis. And I usually fry four or five at the same time. There you go. So normally it should poof up. It should poof up, as they said, there should be a hollow. When they poof up, something to poof up. And so here it is, story of my mandazis. <laughs> Try till they're golden brown. Okay. Show you one. It depends because Ome, yourself, Nurin and Dad, they all like it a little over fry but normally it should be this color you see and then you put it how i do is i put a paper towel on the tray and then i take them out to let the oil drain out there isn't too much oil so there it is
and we're back. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, watching my mom make mandazis and tell stories about when I was a kid. <laughs> so we're going to continue now with the bajias. So remember the bajias are um, the black eyed peat fritters. So I know, in, so the twist here, I guess, is that um, in India, we make, um, oh, just dropped some of my mic there. We make the bajias with uh, darja bajia, right? You make it with lentils or even pakoras are kind of similar uh, where you coat, um, where you coat uh, vegetables and fry them. So it's similar to that, but black eyed peas are a very common uh, um, bean, a, a legume as they're called, or a pulse um, that uh, you find in East Africa. And um, so as I mentioned, so anyways, I had, I'll continue my story in a second, but what I did is I blended, like I mentioned in the food processor, Oh, we have a little video problem. What happened? Your phone is low battery. Oh, shoot. Okay. okay. Well, there we go. All right. That's we just right. had a little low battery um, warning, but we'll, we'll charge that up when we're, when we're watching the next segment. No problem. So as I was saying that um, we blended the, uh, just the soaked black eyed peas uh, with the onion. So this is what it looks like when it's all blended. And I'm going to dump that into a bowl and mix it with the rest of the ingredients. So black eyed peas are very common in East Africa. And as I mentioned, I moved to South Carolina um, about four years ago. I, you know, met a person and had to move here. <laughs> met a dude, he's behind the camera. Um, <laughs> he just waved to y'all. Um, so I moved here and my first New Year's, um, I was informed that it's a, it's a pretty important southern tradition to have black eyed peas on new year's day black eyed peas symbolizes what is it good luck it's good luck and tradition good luck and tradition tradition and good luck southerners are a lot like africans and indians i think um so good luck uh is the black eyed peas and also you have to have a green like uh collards or mustard green turnip greens which uh symbolizes wealth uh for the new year that's the way you bring in the new year so our first new year's together as a family uh, we were like, we really have to do this dish, and uh, we really wanted to make it um, a, a combination dish, a fusion dish. So um, I remember um, my mom used to make these budgias. So I'm like, why don't we make budgias? They're black eyed peas. And um, here in the South, people boil the black eyed peas with ham, which we're not going to do. I'm Muslim. Scott is vegetarian. So this has become our um, New Year's Eve, our New Year's Day tradition, which to me is really important uh, for it to be African, Indian and Southern because that's a mix of our family. So anyways, we have the black eyed peas, the onions, uh, cut up some cilantro. I love a lot of fresh cilantro in my budgets. So put that in there, cut, cut them up pretty fine because um, they're not going in the, the food processor. You would think you could put it in the food processor. The reason you don't wanna do that is that they'll get too, um, they'll get too watery and then we'll just turn the whole mixture green. So that's just not the most exciting way to eat food. So you just wanna blend it up. I mean, mix it up like this. Okay, a bit of salt, just put in a bit of salt. There we go. And then we're done. People eat these budgias and think they're amazing and think there's a bunch of spices in it. Um, you know, Jean Weingarten would think that there was just one spice, in it, but there's actually no spice just salt, um, which I think makes it a really, really brings out the cilantro and the black eyed peed flavors. Um, so what we'll do when we get back from our video on mogul, it's the next thing we're going to learn, um, we will fry this up. So without further ado, let's watch our video on mogul. We're here in Spartanburg with Ashrafanti. Ashrafanti, tell us um, where you're from. Um, my name is Ashraf Ellison. I'm from East Africa, Uganda. Uh, we came to England in 1972 when we were asked to leave the country. After six months, I came and settled in the U.S. So today we are making some mogo cassava. 
And also, um, I think here in the States, people call it yucca, right? Yeah. So this is the bag that I get from Publix. And it's frozen? It's frozen. And uh, I have soaked it in water so it can get thawed out. And I'm going to put a little bit of salt and I'm going to put it to boil. Okay. So like one teaspoon of salt? I put half. Half a teaspoon? Mm -hmm. And how many pieces are there? Uh, I just put a few. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. few. <laughs> okay. Wires long, so you can just okay. Just so, so yeah, let it boil. I'll cover it up so it'll boil a little faster. Okay. So Ashwanti, the reason why I, I asked you to make mogo is because when I did your oral history interview, you were telling me how in high school um, you would sell mogo at the school canteen. Right. So, um, they asked two of our uh, class uh, roommates, you know, like, you know, would we help them sell mogo? So during recess, you know, we used to, my friend and I used to sell mogo. And, you know, uh, we didn't have plates at the time. And we used to use newspaper and put mogo on it, but the color was fast color. Like, you know, it didn't leak like color over here in the newspaper, you know. So we'd put, uh, and then from home, we'd carry salt, uh, cystric acid, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, chili powder, and uh, we'd put all the mogo in it uh, at the recess. We didn't even have spoons we had to use our hand to eat with. So that was fun. Then we had mango trees in our schoolyard, and we'll cut up mangoes, we'll take the knife with us, and uh, eat it with our mogo, and it was really good fun. Miss and, those days. And that's what we're going to be doing today, right? We're going to be doing mogo with salt and chili? Yes. Mm -hmm. This will be fried. Okay. Yeah. So first we boil, then we fry. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go take a look at the boiling. Okay, now the mogo is boiling. What I do is, you know, I know when it's ready, when it's turning yellow, because when I put it in, it's white. When it's yellow, I know it's done. So is this done? Uh, almost. Oh. Okay, my mogo is done now, and I'm going to cut it, and then we'll, we'll start frying it in a few minutes. So you know it's done because it's yellow and softer? Yes. You can check it and see, you know, it's done, softer. Okay, so I'm going to drain the mogul in the sink. So it takes the starch out too, all right? Then I'm going to cut it up. Yes. It doesn't burn your fingers? Oh, no. I've got a way of doing it. Watch it. I'll put it in here. Then what I do is I cut it. So when you used to sell them in Uganda, uh -huh. it was just like this, just boiled? Uh, no, uh, those Africans, they used to uh, like mix it with a big wooden stick because they used to make a bunch of it. Mm -hmm. And all they did was put um, uh, turmeric powder in it and that was, that was all. Huh. And salt. So that's why, you know, we had to take our own ingredients, add it to it. So the Ugandans, when they eat it, they just put it with salt and turmeric, and then you added the chilies? Is that like an Indian? Yes, like yes. An Indian flair? Yeah. So we used to add to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes, you know, you have all this uh, 
fiber in, inside so you know it's it's a good thing you know just you know take it out cut it out see this right so cut that out so it's easier you know to put in a big uh, plate like this so you don't burn your hand and I just you know cut it up and put this on the side This is how I'm tasting the oil. It's ready now. So I can put my mogo in it. So it's just vegetable oil? Yes. Just fry it in there. Uh huh. Thank you. Hot, no? So I don't think we discussed what is mogo. It's it's uh like it grow, grows under the ground, and uh, you can tell when the mogo is ready to be dug out because the the plant will have little seeds on top of it. Yeah, and uh, you know it's just like potatoes. It grows underground. And, you know, when I was taking my Swahili class, I learned that it is mohogo, but we say mogo, right? Yeah, and it, uh, on the, yeah, we always say mogo, mogo, but they say mohogo. So how did that, do you know how that changed? Remember how we talked about the language changing? How did it change from mohogo to mogo? Well, you know, we didn't know how to pronounce it, so that's how we call it, we call it, call it mogo. <laughs> <laughs> And here in North America, I don't think people know so much what is mogo, right? Even oh. cassava or yuca. Oh, but the Mexicans do. Right. They eat that. Mexicans and uh, before, uh, when I was in India, they didn't have mogo at that time. But now you can get mogo in India also. So you, because you went to India for school, right? Right. Yeah. And tell me about that. Did you, you missed Mogo while you were there? No, because uh, I was very young uh, when uh, my uncle lived in India. My mom is from India. So I was only four and my uncle said, why don't you leave her over here? Right. So okay. the reason that I cannot speak, I mean, write in Gujarati mm -hmm. is because, um, we went to Catholic school over there, so they only taught English. Right. So that's the reason I don't know my mother tongue, how to write it. I can speak well, mm -hmm. but I don't know how to write or read. Mm -hmm. So that's one disadvantage. But you speak Kachi and Gujarati, right? We talked about that a lot. Too. Right. And then, uh, because, you know, we got uh, people from Pakistan over here. So I've picked up on speaking a little bit of Hindi. Mm. And I, I've got a cousin in India and she only takes talks in Hindi. And so, you know, I, I find it difficult. So <laughs> my language is all mixed up between Suhaili, Kachi, Gujarati and Hindi. It's horrible. <laughs> it's not horrible, it's beautiful. <laughs> mm.
I like it crispy. So how long do you fry it for? Uh, till I, you know, I feel like it's a little brown, brownish, just a little bit, and uh, it's crispy. Okay, now the mogu is ready, nice and crispy. And a bit brown. Uh -huh. And then we put it on a paper so you can suck on the extra oil. Oh, that looks so good. Sometimes here they're called yuca fries, right? Yes, they do. So do like Mexicans and Latin Americans make it the same way we make it? Right? Oh, I'm not sure because sometimes when the cashier, she'd ask me, uh, how do you eat this thing? Mm -hmm. And I say, it's just like potatoes. You boil it, you cut it up, and you fry it. And so we're going to put uh, a little bit of um, chili powder on it. Or you can, if you don't eat hot, stuff then you can put paprika powder so it looks colorful and uh, you can sprinkle a little salt a little salt on it and it's ready to be eaten now <laughs> All right, and we're back. I'm gonna kneel down. Yummy cassava. <laughs> All right, so back to the bhajia. Last step, of course, the last step is to fry it. Apparently that's what we do back home in East Africa. So here's our mix, right? Uh, black eyed peas, cilantro, salt and onions. That's it. And it is so good. And I see that Alison McCletchie's on the call who lives down the street from me. So guess who's getting some budgie on some cassava in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so what you wanna do is kind of roll it up into a bowl. You can do it by hand or you can do a teaspoon. I roll it up with just this tablespoon measure, right? Plop it into the oil. Hear that baby frizzle. Elizabeth's trying to get in on the. Sorry. The little <laughs> one from two under. You might want to. I forgot to mention this. And my my mossy and my mom are watching. They're going to be disgusted by me that I forgot this step. But what you want to do actually is take a fork and fluff it up a bit so it's nice and airy inside too. So can you, I, I don't know if the, is the video okay? Can you see me? It's great. Fluffing. Mm -hmm. You know, just like you would do with rice, and then. You know, it's a bit more airy and crunchy. So throw it in. Finish all of this now. And we see on the video that a lot of y'all are cooking. So after this step, we will definitely invite you to share your video. So just unmute yourself if you want to share with us what you cooked um, and how it turned out. And of course, if you have any questions, um, my mom who did the mandazi um, is online, I'm here. And I'm not sure if Ashavanti is online, but if she is, you can ask her some questions about Mogo. And let's have a conversation and enjoy some food together. So you wanna fry these budgets and they will kind of, I fried some before during the video and that's what you want them, that's the color you want them to be. I like it super um, crunchy and dark. Uh, some people like it lighter. As my mom mentioned for the mandazi, I love it over fried. So for the budgia um, too. So that's what we got. We got the budgia, they're frying, but um, thanks for tuning into the budgia. We'll, we'll throw up the recipe right now. Um, just so you can you can see that, and then we'll come back for a bit of a conversation. We can just stay here and talk.
All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, can you see me all right? Can you see our beautiful plant in our beautiful kitchen? <laughs> so thank you to everyone uh, for joining today. I just want to plug again um, this book by Sada called Our Stories. Um, it's a book published with um, this, a lot of the Sada collection. Um, so please do order it online. I'm sure that um, Samit and Mariam will put the link uh, in the chat. Uh, there's a bit of a, you know, an excerpt from the, um, from one of the pieces that I wrote for this project. And also I think some have mentioned that um, the fellowship is starting over again. So if you're interested, if you've got stories to tell, we've all got stories to tell, please apply uh, for the fellowship. Uh, it's a really excellent opportunity to, you know, to share with your community and to learn from your community. You know, you might end up a good cook. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's the cooking portion we got here. I would really love to hear from everyone if you have any questions. If you can show us, I know Umber, you're cooking. I can see you're cooking along. Um, turn on your camera. Let us know what you got. Or any questions anyone has? Yeah, and my mom is here. If you have any questions about Mandazi, I know some people are mentioning that they um, that they missed the step about the yeast. Mom, I don't know if you can hear, but can you mention again what the yeast is? You mix the yeast with warm water, a pinch of salt, a pinch of sugar, and a pinch of flour and let it rise for about five minutes and then put it into the mix. She's not listening. Uh, she's not listening. They're at a <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> They're driving to Calgary right now. But, I have a question yeah. of question about the yeast. How much water were we supposed to use for that? Any questions, comments? Want to show us what you're cooking, Amber? <laughs> Ome, could you hear Ifad's question? Can you hear us? Ome, can you hear us? Or maybe Ome can't hear us right now. Oh, your dough is sticky. So what you want to do is you want to add flour to wherever you're rolling it. So if you're rolling it on a on a cutting board or on your counter, add a lot of flour um, and then roll it out. Oh, there's your mom. She's back. So, oh, so wow. that it doesn't, so that it doesn't stick on your cutting board. Mom, you're on mute. Oh, no, we're on mute. We can't hear. Oh. Here's how mine came out. How did I do? Oh. Good job, Lina. Mom, that's Umber. That's not Lina. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. It was really nice to have you. Um, join us in our kitchen here in South Carolina. Um, and learn about kind of the history of this community from, um, you know, the Indian, Ugandan, South Carolinian, uh, East African, Tanzanian, all of it mixed up. Um, if one has a question, okay. Do you want to turn on your watch? the water you wanted to ask me. Hi. Hi. Yeah, we were just wondering how much water to add in the yeast because we put half a cup and it was too much water. That's <laughs> then we had... <laughs> how much water for the yeast when you do the yeast? Mama. Yeah. Get your corny the ginger yeast me. Can't hear you, me. How much milk do you put in the? Uh, how much water, warm water, to make the yeast mix? Um, I would say, um, well, it depends how much, uh, like, what's the portion you are making, right? So if the portion, if you're making two cups, I would put uh, probably say, because it depends if you use one cup to, if you use one cup of water and milk mixed, I would say I would take out one third of the, that water to make the yeast. Okay, so one third of a cup. Yeah, of does that make water. sense? Yeah. Yeah. For a, that's you. for one tablespoon of yeast, right? This is, I will mention again, I think I didn't mention this in the beginning that I don't know if you've ever cooked yeah, yeah. for your father. Oh, come on, we lick it. No, no, no. Measurements okay. are never exact, right? <laughs> 
So yeah. play around with it. Try it a few times. But yeah, well, half a cup is definitely too much water. <laughs> Hi, Yasmin. Ooh, look Shana at that. Oh, good. Oh, my God. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yasmin. All right. Anyone else? I'm really glad that some people oh were God. Okay. So good. <laughs> Hi, Yasmin. Shana is Bola T. Ajaxi. I have no idea. Oh, there's my sister. Mm -hmm. All right. So we will probably take this opportunity to close out. Again, please um, do follow Sada um online on all the social medias um all of the fellows will be putting up our work at an on an online exhibition um so please do check that out i'll be putting up these um, oral histories um in a couple of weeks um what ingredient binds the budget together nothing the one thing I, I kind of didn't mention, and I should have, is when you put it in the food processor, if you're seeing it's not blending, add just a bit of water, like half a tablespoon. That will help it mix, but nothing really blends it together. You just gotta keep it together with your hand when you put it in the oil or with a spoon and just kind of dollop it in. Nothing binds it together. Like there's nothing in that budget, which makes it just that, that those flavors really come out a bit more, yeah. So, yeah, please keep in tune with Sa uh, Sada and Samif, Mariam, if you want to say anything to close out. I just want to thank you, Omeda. This was so incredible. I had, had a smile on my face the whole time. I <laughs> thank your mom and your aunties for sharing their recipes and their time with us. It's, uh, this is so lovely. And we're going to post the videos, too, just by themselves, mm -hmm. in case anyone wasn't able to cook along today and they want to later, and the recipes as well. And I just but want to mention you. that Ashravanti is on the video here. Ashravanti. Ashravanti. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. <laughs> I just saw that you were on. I was at, oh, you're on mute, Ashravanti. But I was at her house yesterday to record the, the mogul. That's why I had some. <laughs> Ashravanti is a great cook. All right, y'all. Thank you so much.